Good job. Well, that was fun. If you weren't stomping your foot, you're not alive. Have somebody next to you just check your pulse, and if we need medical attention, we'll get it to you. Hey, uh, my name's Ryan Paulson. I'm the lead pastor here, and it is good to see you this morning. Hey, I, I hope if you were here last week that you enjoyed A.J. Sherrill as much as I did, um, and we love having voices sort of from the larger Christian community to have the chance to encourage us. Uh, but we also love the chance to raise up our own voices. And in your bulletin, when you walked in this morning, you got a list of all the residents that we have this year who are at Denver Seminary and who are also serving with us. And we feel like one of our goals, one of our jobs as a church community is to help raise up a next generation of pastors, of leaders, of kingdom ministers. And so um, today you have the special opportunity to hear from Luke Rosenberger, who's one of our residents. He's been over at Denver Seminary for two years. This is his third year, um, and we've had the great opportunity to invest in him, but he's given way more um, to this body than I think we've been able to give to him. So I hope that you embrace the reality that this is part of our DNA as a church. We're so close to the seminary, and we want to have the chance to build into the future leaders. So I hope you lean in today. You're going to learn a lot from Luke. He's a great communicator, and I'm going to pray for him, and then he's going to come up. Jesus, thanks for today. Thanks for the chance to be here, uh, to be together. Uh, we love you, and we lift up Luke as he comes and opens the scriptures for us today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Good morning, everybody. I'm grateful to be here with you guys and um, getting to open God's word today with you all. Uh, my family, like Ryan said, um, has been here for two years um, and just really in, just love this body. Um, just enjoyed uh, being at South Fellowship and just getting a chance to plug in with the young adults um, as well. So, hey, I want to tell you, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we were going to have this worship night. And I had this vision months before. And we were going to have lots of young adults come to the great outdoors of Colorado and just enjoy seeing uh, the creation that God has created, the mountains in the background. There's a lake, uh, the brilliant stars that God made, and just enjoy worshiping our creator outside. And each of the last couple summers, at the, at the end of the summer for the young adults, we've had a worship night in the park. And so we were excited. I was really excited about this year, uh, trying to do something uh, great and just really do something that was really cool. A few months ago, uh, the Ascent Project band led worship here at church, and, and my wife and I both looked at our, each other and said, this is a band that would be great to lead that, that night. And so I contacted them. They were willing to come, and we were excited. Uh, I'd been talking with these guys and just seeing what God was going to do that night. Our own Eric Schmidt came out and set up all the sound equipment. And he uh, graciously brought his own equipment and had it all set up. The band came and did a mic check. Now, earlier in the day, uh, there was a, the forecast said there was a chance of rain. And so, you know, I was praying, God, keep that rain away. Uh, this, is, this night is for you. It's hundreds of young adults would be coming to worship you. Uh, we're going to see what you're going to do tonight. And we just kept praying, no rain. And even there was a staff retreat that night, or that, that day, and we were praying at the staff retreat. And so I thought, oh, if, if nothing else, like, everybody's praying, like, no rain, for sure, no rain. But then the, the clouds started getting a little bit dark, and I was like, okay, well, interesting, but, you know, we're okay, we're okay. And, and then uh, my wife called me when she was getting to the park, and she was going to have the kids play at the playground, and she said, uh, do you think we should go to, to the library first? I mean, this was right, this is Climate Park, so Climate Park has the playground, the amphitheater. The, there's a library right there. 
And I said, yeah, you better. Let's, let's just not take the risk. So they went in, into the library instead of coming to the playground. And let me show you my family really fast. Um, so so this, this is Clement Park, and uh, just the gr- creation that we were going to get to be outside and worship Jesus together. But my family, um, I'm married to Ellen. Um, she is an gr- incredible mom, a author, and a passionate worship leader. Um, the, we have t- four kids, uh, David, Emily, Lucy, and Elizabeth, and we have been blessed with their energy and excitement and their joy in our life. And um, so, yeah, that's just a little bit about my family. Uh, we are, yeah, I'm studying here at Denver Seminary and uh, just in starting my third, third year last week, this week. And so um, that's back to the story. Okay, so we were, <laughs> we were this, the clouds were getting a little dark. The wind started picking up. Now, there was a few of us leaders that were setting up in the pavilion across the way, and so we were setting up for food, and we were going to have a fellowship time before it started. And so we were, we were getting a little bit worried about the wind and the, the storm that might be coming, and then, uh, then all of a sudden, it started sprinkling, and I was like, oh, no. Okay, all right, God, just, just keep the storm. If it's going to come, let it come fast and just be done really quick, and it won't cause anybody to not come tonight. Or keep the storm off. Either way, just whatever is going to happen. We want to do this for you, Jesus. So there was four of us, and the next thing you know, we are huddled on top of a picnic table in the pavilion, and you see the white in the background, because that's hail. (laughs) And I was smiling in this picture, but not really happy. (laughs) Um, I was really, really disappointed. What? God, why, why is this happening? This is a worship night for you. This is great things are going to happen this night. And yet, we were huddled around a blanket, a picnic blanket, on top of a table in a pavilion, and we were still getting wet. Our shoes and legs were still getting wet from uh, hail and wind and rain. And I was so disappointed. And I was hoping, okay, well, maybe, maybe after the hail's over, maybe... We could still salvage the night. So I ran across. The hail lasted probably 10 minutes, and then the rain started slowing down. And I ran across the, the way to where the amphitheater was. And I knew the band was there, and they had been setting up, and they had been doing their mic checks and sound check and everything. And I, and I went over to them, and when I got there, I saw, first of all, puddles everywhere on the lawn. And I, and I got up on the stage, and it was like a lake. <laughs> And the worship, or the, the sound equipment was all being put away, and it was soaking wet. And I was hoping and praying that Eric's equipment wasn't ruined. Thankfully, it wasn't. And the band was disheveled, and they were disappointed. And they, I went right up to them, and they said, Luke, we tried. And we're really disappointed what happened, but let's just pick up the pieces, and, and we'll come back another time. And I said, oh but can't we do something? <laughs> like, no, like one of our cars broke down, one of, you know, like, we, and one of them just said, we're, we're just not ready. Like, we just got hit by hail. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so sometimes we get disappointed in our life. There's storms that come. And we, we salvaged something. I was proud of Molly and Kevin, who were both new, working with the young adults that, that night, and they, and they suggest, hey, let's go back to the church and let's, let's have a worship night still. And it was, a, it was a great night, but it wasn't the same. It, and I wonder if sometimes you feel disappointed, and that sometimes storms happen to you. I was disappointed by the work that got washed away that night. But, you know, we all face storms in our lives. There's people in this room that have had a storm of a relationship that ended. Maybe it was a dating relationship. Maybe it was an engagement. Maybe it was a marriage. But whatever the case was, that relationship, when it ended, that caused destruction, and that caused pain and hurt, disappointment for sure. Or maybe 
I know there's people in this room that have had careers that were really excited about what, what you wanted it to do in your, with your life, with your ministry, or with your job, your vocation. And the job that you had, or were hoping to had, have, came to an end. And there was disappointment, and hurt, and pain, and change of expectation. Maybe you got a phone call this week, or last week, recently, you had a phone call that changed your life, that caused disappointment and pain. Maybe it had to do with your health or someone that you love, their health. And that, that pain is real. So storms come, and we, we can't avoid the storms because they are a part of our life. The question isn't how you can avoid the storm, but how do we get through those storms? And this summer, we've been going through a series called The Sermon on the Mount, um, the arts of human flourishing. And Jesus preached this sermon. It's recorded in Matthew 5 through 7. Uh, and Jesus preached this sermon. It's considered the greatest sermon ever. And I've loved that we've gone through each, each um, text of this sermon and taken the summer to do that. And it's been really challenging. And some people even say, ah, you can't really, Jesus doesn't really expect us to do those things. Okay, well, why did he preach it then? <laughs> Last week, uh, we heard about the narrow or wide gate. We heard about true or false prophets. So Jesus is leading up to his conclusion in Matthew 7 with two choices. So now we're at the end, and we, we're probably wondering the same thing that the crowd was wondering. How is Jesus going to end? How is he going to finish his sermon? Well, Jesus finishes his sermon by sharing a story about two builders, and they each made a choice. But before we jump into the scriptures, let's pray and commit this to God. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have your words, we have your scripture. God, we ask that your word would speak into our, each of our lives, that God, you would anoint this time and that your spirit would fill this place. Teach us each what you have for us today. And we pray this in your name. Amen. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to read at verses 24 and 25. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to open it to Matthew 7, verse 24. All right, so Jesus says, Matthew... 7, verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down and the streams rose and the winds blew against and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So let's pause there for a second. And we see that Jesus is speaking about a house. And this house survived the storm. Now, during the storm... The question isn't, is the rain going to stop or what's going to happen, but is the rain and the storm going to destroy this house? Is, it, is the house that I've built going to survive? Is it going to endure? Is it going to last? Did you know that each of us are building a life? Now, Jesus talks about a storm against a house, but let's look at the, let's look at the storm against our life. Because each of us, is building a life. And because all of us are building a life, it's a process. And that process is ongoing. It takes time. We don't get up here one day and say, I'm done, my house is ready. But it's a, it's a process. And I think we all want to build a life that lasts a storm, that endures, that survives, because the reality is the storms come. And today, Jesus wants us to understand how to build a life that survives that storm, because those storms come. So you might be asking the question, well, what materials do we need to build a life that survives a storm? I'm glad you asked, because there's two things we're going to look at today from Jesus' word. And I love the way that Jesus 
wants us to build a beautiful life, a life that flourishes. So let's dive into what that looks like. So in verse 21, just a little bit before uh, this, we're going to read what Jesus said. Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Oh, this is harsh. <laughs> these, people, these people were doing things for Jesus. They were doing incredible things for Jesus. But they were deceived. They were deceived because they thought that they knew Jesus and this is what Jesus wanted. But, you know, we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we are kingdom people doing things that Jesus wants because of the gifts that we have, the gifts that we perform, the gifts that we've used. But Jesus doesn't know these people. There's an absence of relationship. They were doing the Father's will, or they weren't doing the Father's will. And the Father's will, we know, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, like we're going to find out in the next series. Doing God's will is loving God and loving others. And in John 17, verse 3, says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. When Jesus becomes our greatest treasure, you don't have to worry about losing that treasure. Jesus is eternal life. And, we need, and he invites us to be in relationship with him. So, what's the first material we're going to need? First material we need for building a life is a relationship with Jesus, not performance for Jesus. These people were saying, I, all these things I did in your name, I prophesied, drove out demons, I performed many miracles, those seem like good things, but they didn't do it in Jesus. They did it in Jesus' name, but they didn't do it in relationship with Jesus. Recently, our uh, worship pastor, Aaron Bjorklund, said, you know it isn't good if Jesus extends his hand to you and says, or has to say, hi, I'm Jesus. What's your name? It's nice to finally meet you. It's nice to meet you finally. That's not good. If Jesus is saying that to you, that means you're not in relationship with Jesus. Now, there's a difference between knowing Jesus knowing about Jesus, and knowing him personally. If I know someone personally, I know things about, and not just things about them, but I know them well. Now, there's a guy that probably most of you know, um, but not know personally, just like me. I don't know Peyton Manning personally, but I know a lot about Peyton Manning. I had to put on there, he, he won Super Bowls for the Colts and Broncos, not just the Broncos, uh, I'm a Colts fan, <laughs> but yeah, I know a lot about Peyton Manning. I can tell you things for a while about Peyton Manning's statistics and different games he had and different comebacks and Super Bowls and things, but if Peyton Manning came up to me, he would probably extend his hand to me and say, hi, I'm Peyton Manning. <laughs> What's your name? It's nice to meet you finally. He doesn't know me. I know a lot about him, but he doesn't know me. And the same is true with our relationship with Jesus. Our relationship with Jesus is, should be personal and intimate, life-giving. Jesus wants us to be in that close relationship with him. So how does being in a relationship with Jesus help us weather the storm? Well, during a storm, I know when I was little, I was afraid of storms, and I would run to my parents' room, or I'd run to where my parents are. And were my parents going to stop the storm? 
No. <laughs> my parents, they couldn't control anything about the storm, but they gave me comfort and peace and safety and relationship. And Jesus is more than that. <laughs> Jesus can stop the storm, but he gives us comfort and safety and peace during the storm. You know, as parents, sometimes um, we are actually not sometimes, but we provide things for our kids. And we provide things that they need and sometimes things that they just want but they don't really need. Um, so we buy things, we help them. But if that's all we ever did was we just gave them stuff, provided stuff for them, it would be kind of sad. There won't be a relationship, or not much of a relationship. Yeah, I'll buy you these nice things and you can have fun with them for a little bit, but that's not a relationship. A relationship looks like doing things with your parents or with your kids, spending time together, making memories, going to their games, going to their activities, their performances, playing with them, doing things. It's being involved, and that's a relationship. It's not just, here's some stuff. And relationships are like that. Because presence is greater than presence. We want to be near Jesus, and Jesus wants us to be near him. We don't just want the stuff. So maybe you don't prophesy, maybe you don't perform miracles, but, but maybe you give to the poor. Maybe you come to church. Maybe you look like you have it all together. And, but without a relationship with Jesus, Jesus says, I don't know you. Get away from me, you evildoer. Because Jesus doesn't want our performance. He wants us to be in relationship with him. And that's the first material that will help us survive the storm. So what other material do we need? Well, let's go back to the story of the two builders. So in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, uh, Jesus says this, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Now, Jesus lays out very clearly there's two options. The first man he called wise because he built his house on the rock. And in the storm, the house survived and it lasted. It stood firm. The second man he called a foolish man. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. And during the storm, that house was destroyed. So the second material that we need in building a life that lasts the storm, that survives, endures the storm, is to practice Jesus' words. Not to overlook Jesus' words, not to ignore Jesus' words, not to forget Jesus' words, but Jesus wants us to practice his words. It says in verse 24, Therefore any, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice... When you, put your, when you put Jesus' words into practice, that is what Jesus is talking about in building a life. Building a life that survives, that lasts through the storm. Putting Jesus' words into practice. And it's a process. He doesn't say, put these words of mine into completion, do it like 100% well all the time. No, he said practice it. Start getting in the habit and the rhythms of doing what Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. He doesn't expect perfection from us. And building a life is a process, but so is building a house. I remember when I was 14, the, uh, my dad was building a house for our family, and he involved me in the process. And I remember the first part of the house 
we had the, the guys come out and build, uh, dig down and get the basement ready. And I remember thinking, why is this taking so long to get the basement ready? <laughs> like, we don't even see the basement. From the outside, you see the first floor and the second floor, the roof, blah, blah, blah. Right? But you don't see the basement. The basement doesn't seem very important. But that foundation is what's going to decide the fate of that house standing or being destroyed. And the same is true in our lives. We need that foundation to be the, on the rock. And so what is, what is Jesus talking about when he's talking about a rock? Well, when I think about the rock, um, and may, maybe you and I think of rock and we think of a few different things. Well, um, yeah, firm foundation, that's good. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Uh, but there's also, you know, the object, there's a rock. There's a kind of music. Uh, there's the actor, the rock. <laughs> or is he, yeah, an actor. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's something that we use a lot, the, talking about rock. Now, Jesus used the, the Greek word Petra. And uh, I know some of the older people, including me, in the room will think, Petra, Petra means rock. Of course I know that because of the 80s rock band. <laughs> Petra means rock. But yeah, so it does mean rock. Um, and it's the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 16, verse 10, when Jesus was talking to Simon. And he said, I'm going to call you Petros. I'm going to call you Peter. Because on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus is talking about a rock. And what is that rock a rock, when, when people then would think about the word rock, they would think about, of course, a firm foundation that was steady, that was unchanging. But they also use rocks in war for protection, for weapons, for safety, like a mighty fortress we sang about today. Rocks were large and unmovable, and they can give life. And they would use, in their crops, uh, the limestone would erode, and it would be nutrients for life. So it's life-giving. And throughout the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, we hear about God is our rock. So what did that mean? Well, Jesus was saying that the rock is a firm foundation, He's our, that God is our protector and our defender. God is steady and unchanging. He's large and unmovable, and he's life-giving. Oh, and this just in, Jesus was preaching from a rock. He was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, on a rock. And so Jesus talks about this rock, but then he talks about, he talks about the sand. And where would you rather build your house? On the rock or on the sand? And it's, I think Jesus is trying to ask kind of a silly question because I think everybody would say, that's really foolish, that's silly, why would anybody build their house on the sand? Well, yeah, I think that's, that was Jesus' point. When you think of sand, when they think of sand, there we go. Then we think of sand, right? Now, some people try to build houses on the sand. Those are called sandcastles. And sandcastles are not supposed to endure the storm or the waves. Uh, however, you don't see sandcastles last. And so sand is not a firm foundation, clearly. But the way of Jesus is a firm foundation, and we have a coffee shop named Solid Grounds. Firm foundation, right? We want to remember what that is. On the solid rock I stand. All the ground is sinking sand. Our firm foundation is Jesus. And in this Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> Jesus wants us to practice his words. He wants us to practice reconciliation instead of anger. He wants us to choose honesty instead of hiding. He wants us to choose humility rather than reconciliation. I'm sorry, rec retaliation. He wants us to choose love and pray for our enemies. He wants us to practice forgiving instead of being bitter. He wants us to live out our faith for God instead of for the praise of others. He wants us to choose the kingdom of God over money. He would rather 
we, that we trust in him rather than worry. He wants us to choose to be a life-giving presence rather than condemning. And he wants us to practice doing unto others as we would have them do unto you. And what would it look like if we did this? If we practice doing these things, practice doing the words of Jesus, the body of South Fellowship Church, that would be just an incredible thing if we practice putting Jesus' words into action. In James 122 to 24 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do it, do what it says, is like someone who looks in, at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. We know throughout, throughout the scriptures we need to do what Jesus wants us to do. Do the will of your heavenly Father. Not just listen and forget or overlook. <clears throat> now, uh, a sermon that Ryan preached uh, in the Ethos series a few months ago about practice, he showed us uh, 12 spiritual practices of how we can try to um, align ourselves with the grace and love that God is pouring out. Not trying to earn God's favor or his grace, but trying to to just practice um, posturing ourselves in the way of Jesus, with the heart of Jesus. And so these things are available actually in the, in the lobby. <clears throat> but uh, silence and solitude, simplicity, fasting, Sabbath, secrecy, submission, Bible reading and memorization, worship, prayer, soul friendship, personal reflection, and service. So I would invite you, if that's something um, you would like to continue looking at, how do I live in the way of Jesus with the heart of Jesus, not trying to earn God's favor, here's some ways that you can do that. And maybe there's some areas in your life, in my life, that I'm not putting into practice Jesus' words. And I would just invite you this week, to, and even today, to think about, what that is. Is there things of Jesus' words that I'm overlooking, I'm ignoring, I'm not wanting to put into practice because it's too hard? And to confess those things to Jesus and to put those into practice. Now, Jesus lands a plane next, puts a nice bow on the sermon, finishes it nicely. Oh, wait, no, he didn't. Um, <clears throat> Jesus says, uh, have a relationship with me, uh, build your life on the rock, put in the, my words into practice, and mic drop out. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus doesn't say all the details that maybe we would, we would like him to say. Like, okay, what does that mean? How do we do that? What, what does it look like? The people were so surprised. So let's look at what Jesus says uh, what happens in the last two verses of this chapter? In verses 28 and 29, Jesus, uh, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught with one who had authority and not as teachers of their law. Now, the crowd, they were so amazed, dumbfounded, like, wow, did Jesus really just say all those things and like, just end the sermon like that? Uh, I guess he did. What are we supposed to do about that? <laughs> uh, wow, he's, it's over. Now we have to make a choice. I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrased that verse, and he said, there had never been, they had never heard teaching like this. It was apparent that he was living everything he was saying. Quite a contrast to their religious leaders and teachers. Jesus was living it out. And these people were like, wow, all these things that Jesus just said, Jesus is serious. He didn't say, here's some things that, I sh that you should do if you, if you can figure it out. Jesus wants us to put these things into practice. So what did they decide? What did the crowd do? Well, we find out in the next verse, when Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. 
they chose, it seemed like most of them chose, to follow in the way of Jesus. And this reminds me of another time when the crowds left Jesus and Jesus turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave too? And Peter looks at Jesus and says, where else will we go? Only you have the words of eternal life. Jesus, Jesus' life exemplified the person that we want to follow. And interestingly enough, in chapter 8, the disciples followed him into a storm. So they had a choice. And I have a choice. And you have a choice. Look up at me for a second. We all have a choice. Will we choose to build our life on the rock and to trust the maker of the heaven and earth? Trust the shepherd in his relationship? I want you to feel invited to be in an intimate relationship with Jesus because that's what Jesus desires. Jesus is both our Savior and our Rabbi. And the invitation of Jesus is to participate with him in relationship, in putting his words into practice, which leads to obedience with the way, in the way of Jesus, with the heart of Jesus. And I know it might be easier in, temporarily to say, no, no, I can't do that. But the reality is the storms of life are going to come. And when the storms come, are you going to last through the storm or are you going to be destroyed? There was a man in, in 1871 that lost his business in the Great Chicago Fire. And in the same year, he and his wife had a son die of pneumonia. Two years later, his family was traveling across the Atlantic Ocean. But right before the ship was leaving, he realized he needed to go finish something, and he said, I'll meet, meet up with you guys on the other side. I'll take another boat. That boat didn't make it. That ship went down. And his wife somehow survived in the wreckage, but the four daughters were lost. And as... Horatio Stafford traveled on a boat to meet his grieving wife, the loss of their children. He penned these lyrics. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. What did he build his life on? What, did, what was his anchor in the tragedies of his life? What did he do? He knew his shepherd. Not just about God, but he had an intimate relationship with Jesus. And what did he build his life on? He built his life on the rock. And he put Jesus' words into practice. So this is a choice that we all have. And what will you choose? Lord Jesus, I thank you for your words. I thank you for your challenge. God, I ask that you would be showing us and inviting us into a closer and intimate relationship with you. Jesus, I, I thank you for all the words that you taught in this sermon and I ask you to show us each how we can start putting into practice your words and your truth. And God, I thank you that even during the storms that you are with us and we can trust fully in you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.